So uh, please, there he is. All right, good to see you. How you doing? Can you hear me? Are you ready to go? I can. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I forgot the exact name. Well, let's see. The exact. There it is. All lit up. Electronic energy migration in microtubules. R.I.P. Kalra, uh, Center, Center for Biomedical Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Arat, right, take it away, please. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Stewart. Um, nice, to, nice to be at this meeting. Um, I'm going to be talking about my interviews today and some of the experiments that, that I did uh, for my postdoc total um, uh, on my interviews. Uh, this is work that was just published um, earlier this year in the journal ECS Central Science. Okay, and it deals with electronic energy migration in these in these uh, in these protein polymers. Um, so um, the brain requires only twenty watts of power to operate. Okay, um, that's one fourth of the power required um, for uh, for like a regular. Uh, PC computer, which is about 80 watts. Um, does this 20 watts of power come from uh, biochemical interactions only? Um, our present understanding of brain functions is limited to just these biochemical stimuli. So we have, you know, processes such as Michaelis mental kinetics, um, our, our enzyme uh, kinetics mechanisms, um, or, can, or, or, or to, to, to to explain the, this with extremely high efficiency, do we need to also um, involve the processing of light inside neurons? Um, it may, after all, be, um, be easier to explain the high efficiency of, 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 of the brain through photonics in addition to uh, standard biochemistry. Uh, so what I'm thinking about is, um, does the brain also process light? And does that additional processing um, then uh, it can help explain this, this amazingly efficient organ that we have. Uh, now there are um, biological, process, uh, biological systems that do process light, right? Uh, opsins in the eye process light. Uh, chlorophyll, uh, of course, famously uh, absorbs light. Um, we have uh, bird migration that has recently been shown to be light sensitive, uh, magnetic field sensitive, right? Um, but the question really is, um, can unspecialized proteins, uh, can, you know, quote unquote, mundane proteins also actually respond to light in a non-trivial manner? Because if we show or if we find out that even the, the, the structural proteins that can respond to light, I think that's when you will know whether, or whether there, is, um, there is a role of photonics with the brain. So we 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 try to take the first uh, very first sort of steps in this direction. Um, we uh, we analyze these protein polymers from microtubules. Okay, they play a variety of roles in the cell. Um, microtubules um, provide the cell shape and rigidity. They are uh, they are crucial for cell division uh, and, and locomotion, um, and they act um, they act as railroads for the transport of macromolecules inside the cell. So if you want to move something inside the cell from uh, you know one point to another point, you do it along these microtubules. Um, so they're sort of act as the railroads um, inside a cell. Okay, and so and so uh, and so really, uh, microtubules are these, these long slender polymers present all over the cell. Okay, they are made of this protein called tubulin, um, and you can see my present all over the cell they're over here. Um, <coughs> Now they typically interact with a variety of biochemical agents. Okay, so you have these microtubule associated proteins or maps, okay, um, that really uh, regulate cell shape. So an understanding of how microtubules um, change cell shape can be done through maps. Uh, microtubules bind to maps, maps bind to microtubules, uh, and these maps uh, change microtubule rigidity, length, uh, mechanical properties, allowing microtubules to then change the cell shape. Um, there's also drugs that bind to microtubules, uh, taxol, uh, which is used in chemotherapy, and colchicine, um, used for treatment of gout. Both bind to tubulin and microtubules, 
um, and that's how they medically operate. Okay, so, so there is enough history of, of biochemical interactions taking place in microtubules. Um, the question, of course, is uh, what I asked earlier, can microtubules also play photonic roles, um, both perhaps inside the cell and outside it? Okay, so the reason one would be interested in, in microtubules sort of specifically um, is they have these aromatic residues, okay, um, that absorb UV light. Now, now, a lot of proteins have aromatic residues. Okay, what are the aromatic residues? They're tryptophan, tyrosine, and vanillin. Um, they absorb light uh, between 260 and 300 nanometers, and then they re emit this absorbed light um, at, at slightly higher wavelengths. So you, you typically have an emission between 300 and 360 nanometers. Okay, uh, and like I mentioned, many proteins have these aromatic residues. Um, but what really makes tubulin and microtubules special is there are short distances between these aromatic residues that may enable energy transfer. And um, the long range order of the overall microtubule lattice may allow repeated energy transfer to take place. This is a long range, a long range order in a biological system is rare. Okay, microtubules, this is a microtubule. They have this lattice like structure that is very pristine, very ordered over several micrometers. It's an unchanging structure that holds its structure for several hours over several micrometers. So, this is a lattice that. Um, of course, a microtubule is also directionally polarized, meaning one end of a microtubule is morphologically distinct from the other end of the microtubule. And so, really, it's because of these four combined reasons that people talk about microtubules as interesting photonic structures, in addition to the biochemistry that, the, that they, of course, take place. Okay. Um, so, obviously, the question is uh, given this information, could microtubules be used as, as, uh, as novel electronic devices, both inside the cell and outside it? Right? Of course, we're interested more inside the cell at, at the moment. Um, now, tryptophan, um, this is one of the aromatic residues that I spoke about, can be used to study tubular photonics. Okay, so you have uh, an excitation emission spectrum. Um, we put microtubules inside our, our spectral photometer, and we found that you, the microtubules absorb light at 280 nanometers, and they re emit this light between 350 and 300 nanometers. So that's the peak you get here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, AMCA, which is a chloroform conjugated with tubulin 2, absorbs light with tryptophan emits it. So, so you can excite AMCA between 300 and 350 nanometers, okay, and it will re emit this light in around 450 nanometers. So when you have AMCA conjugated tubulin and you polymerize microtubules using this AMCA conjugated tubulin, you get the AMCA emission peak, you get the tubulin slash tryptophan emission peak. But you also get a cross peak. You see this third peak that wasn't there earlier. And this is really interesting because this, this, this indicates energy transfer is taking place between AMCA, which is this chlorophore that absorbs at 350, and tryptophan um, in the side of the tubulin that emits at 350 nanometers. Okay, so you have energy being absorbed at, at, at 280 nanometers from, um, from tryptophan, which is then being transferred to AMCA. Okay, and, and, and that's how this works. That's how this relation will be. Um, so this is modeled, this energy transfer is typically modeled through Foster theory, and it's called Foster resonance energy transfer, okay? So you have um, the emission of tryptophan, uh, which is between 300 and 350 nanometers, like I mentioned, uh, overlapping with the absorbance of AMPA, which is also between 300 and 350 nanometers. Okay, and the, and the rate constant of energy transfer uh, depends on a variety of factors. So it depends on, on the kappa parameter, which is the orientation between the amper and the tubulin. Um, the lifetime of the tryptophan, the distance between them, it's an R6 distance dependence, very strong distance dependence. It depends on the refractive index of the medium between them. And all of these various uh, factors go into determining how many times a second there will be energy transfer between a tryptophan and amper. Okay. So we use time correlated single function counting to, um, to, to quantify this process. Uh, the idea is that you have a solution full of microtubules, um, you impinge with 300 nanometer light, 305 nanometers, type with tryptophans, 
And then you watch um, the, the photonic emission of 335 meters. You observe the time deviations between the, the input photons and the output photons, and this is plotted as a histogram. Uh, you can then fit this to three exponentials and expect fluorescence lifetimes of the tryptophan in this method. Okay, tryptophan is typically fitted three exponentials, so all of my uh, my you know, following part of my talk will will discuss three exponentials. Okay, in TCSPC, which is time for layer three for one thousand. Okay, now um, what I did was I mixed some fully labeled tubulin, which is which is a fully AMCA labeled tubulin, with some unlabeled tubulin. Um, so we have a mixture here, and I polymerized them to form microtubules. Now, depending on the exact ratio that I used, you could have a one is to one, meaning every single tubulin inside the microtubule is labeled with an AMPA. You could have a one is to two, meaning roughly every alternate tubulin is labeled with an AMPA. You know, one is to four, where one fourth are labeled with AMPA, and so on and so forth. Of course, you can have a system where you just not added any AMPA labeled tubulin at all. So you have no AMPA labeled tubulin. So no energy transfer will take place. Right? And so, um, the expectation is that you find lifetime will be large when there's no AMPA, but as soon as you do have an AMPA, um, it will quench uh, the tryptophan fluorescence. Okay. Um, and so the first thing I did was to verify that I did have my tubules in my solution uh, using TEM, transmission electron um, microscopy. Uh, and then I performed uh, tryptophan lifetime measurements on these microtubules. As you can see, as I'm increasing the AMPA concentration, the anchor ratio, uh, the lifetime is reducing, which is as expected. All right, AMPA quenches to prevent fluorescence. Um, this was then fit to three exponentials, and the weighted average lifetime is extracted. And you can see that um, the tubulin lifetime, which is shown in red here, is different from the microtubulin lifetime, which is shown in black here, as a function of AMPA concentration. You can see the tubulin lifetimes uh, are systematically higher. Than the, than the microtubule lifetimes. I remember the dashed lines here are the unlabeled cases where there's no AMPA. Okay, so that's a zero AMPA concentration. Okay, and so could this indicate intertypical energy transfer? Um, let's see. Okay, so I fit these, 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 these lifetime plots, these average weighted lifetime plots, to something called a stern volume plot, uh, which is commonly used in the photovoltaic community to extract a rate constant in energy transfer. I found that the rate constant of energy transfer in tubulin was about seven times a picosecond, uh, but in microtubules, it was about 23 times a picosecond. So the, the energy transfer in microtubules is much faster in the polymer compared to the monomer. Okay. Um, once I extracted this rate constant of energy transfer, um, I fit this to a diffusion equation and I, and I got a diffusion coefficient. Uh, which indicates uh, how far this, this photo excitation of tryptophan migrates along the microtubule. Um, from the diffusion coefficient, I could extract the diffusion length. I found that uh, the diffusion length for energy transfer in the microtubule was about seven nanometers compared to about four nanometers in the tubule. Okay, so there is energy transfer in the microtubule. The lattice like behavior does come into use, however. The distances of energy diff diffusion are not as great as one would have uh, maybe uh, hoped for uh, some serious non trivial photonics. So, you do have a higher diffusion length of about seven nanometers, uh, but it's not 300 nanometers or 100 nanometers, for example. Seven nanometers, remember, is about the dimensions of a tubule in diameter. Okay. Uh, but this seven is greater than the four that's just seen in tubule alone. So, so, there is that. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, now, of course, the big question is, uh, if I add biochemical agents such as anesthetics and other small molecules, um, does that change the observed diffusion length? Does that change the photonics of a tubulin dimer or a microtubule? And so I added two very different anesthetics. Okay, there's etomidate, which is a widely used anesthetic, and isofluorine, which is used for both uh, human and, and sort of veterinary, it's used to stun horses. You can see that they are structurally very different. Uh, it operates has aromatic rings in it. Isofluorine has these um, electronegative fluorines uh, in it. And so once again, I repeated the exact same experiment. You increase the concentration of AMCA and you observe the tryptophan fluorescence lifetimes. Okay, uh, you extract the weighted average lifetimes. 
Uh, you can see that the purple and the green lines are the accommodating isoflurane. Okay, the tryptophan lifetimes in the microtubule with isoflurane and accommodate. Um, and you can see that there's a there's a slight difference they have on uh, on the rate of tryptophan quenching by AMPA. Okay. So you, once again, I fit this to uh, a stern volumer analysis, a stern volumer plot. On the rate constant for energy transfer are significantly lower. They are 17 and 18 times a picosecond compared to 23 times a picosecond. Um, but they're not dramatically lower. Okay. They are lower. And um, if you extract the fuel coefficient um, and use that diffusion length, you can see the diffusion length, uh, the presence of a dominant isofluorine is about five and a half to six nanometers. So, so isofluorine and dominate do lower uh, photoexcitation diffusion migration inside um, uh, a microtubule. And perhaps that is an interesting result uh, because that indicates that biochemical agents such as anesthetic do actually influence tubule and photonics. Um, and so this is a result that I was, I was quite, uh, quite intrigued by. And, uh, and now that I am an assistant professor, this is something I'm going to work on more in the future. Uh, so yes, while uh, while structurally very different, both atomidate and isofluorine decrease to define diffusion lengths. Um, <clears throat> so we, 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 you know, the next obvious step to try to model this effect, right? And to understand why this might be happening. And, and, and so we used Foster resonance energy transfer to understand why this could be happening. Um, and so we we um, we use the PDB file uh, the cubule structure um, and dipole moments the transition dipole moments of tryptophan and tyrosine to extract a Coulombic coupling constant and a coupling constant which is which which is given by the spectral overlap integral here between the initial and the absorbance of, of tyrosine and tryptophan. We use these values to extract a theoretical energy transfer rate constant. Um, we found, however, that um, theoretically speaking, we could only accommodate for a diffusion length of between 1.6 if there's just tyrosines and 1.7 if one includes tryptophan um, in the simulation. So we find that, um, that 1.6 and 1.7 nanometers are, of course, four times smaller than the experimentally observed values of seven nanometers. So there is this difference between what is theoretically predicted um, by FRET. Um, and what we experimentally observe in our in our DCSPC based analysis that I've done, um, and some reasons why this could be happening is that you have protein refractive index is actually variable depending on where you are in the protein. Um, there's eight tryptophans uh, per tubulin dimer roughly, and, um, and 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 about thirty tyrosines. So the environment these these residues are in it can vary dramatically, and that would that would change the, the protein refractive index. Um, Foster theory uses point dipole approximation, but if you have two tyrosines that are right next to each other, the point dipole approximation does break down. Um, and of course, PET does not accommodate for electron energy uh, migration. So, uh, for electron transfer, that is, that is to say, uh, the transfer of physical electrons from one tyrosine to a tryptophan. So these are um, these are some uh, aspects that I will explore when I'm a, uh, when I join IIT Delhi as well in in, in two weeks. Um, but, uh, but but this work did make it to the cover of ACS Center of Science, uh, and the conclusions uh, you should take home uh, with you are that um, perhaps unexpectedly, uh, microtubules, which are known to play structural and biochemical roles in the cell, are extraordinarily efficient light harvesters. Um, and a dominate and isofluorine can actually lower photo excitation to fluid lengths, tailoring electronic energy migration in the microtubule. Uh, so, with this, I uh, thank you for your attention and I'm open to any questions if you have any. Thank you, Ari. That was great. We have some questions, please. Who's he? Sorry, would you be down to? Sorry, would you be down to repeat the question? Okay. 
I'm, I'm asking about the diffusion, so you can get the, you can get something like solitons, or, or it has to maybe couple to something, and that can increase the diffusion length, but, but you need the, a very narrow bandwidth. So I just wonder, or, or you just have photons jumping uh, on the lattice without, the, without any kind of interaction that narrows the bandwidth. I do. So these are, this is just uh, excitonic. So this is, this is photo excitation diffusion. Um, it, it, it's not quite photons, uh, but it's, it's electronic energy that is jumping in on the lattice. Um, you're right. There should be ways to enhance the diffusion length using, uh, using, for example, maybe, maybe AC electric fields or magnetic fields. That, that's an interesting idea that I should look into. Cassie, I think. Hi, I'm uh, Cassandra Ori McKinney uh, from UC Davis. Hey. And I was uh, very curious about, uh, well, I had two questions, but I'll ask you one and I'll email you another one. Um, so I have a question about whether you think that any map binding uh, may change uh, uh, the fret in, in your experiment, specifically with regards to the GTP uh, microtubule lattice. And is this a GMP CVP microtubule? Um, how are you locking it in the GTP state exactly? Yes, great questions. Uh, I'll take the first part first. So we did do experiments on the map tau. Okay, tau is a, tau is a map that's implicated in, in, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, the problem with, with doing experiments on maps is that they invariably also contain their own trip effects. And so you end up getting a signal from the tau or whatever map you're using from their, their trip effects. And so it's hard to deconvolute what's happening in, in you know, because of these maps um, and their with defense. That being said, I do expect maps to also ha uh, have uh, to also enable different diffusion lengths. So that is a, that is something I'm interested in answering. Uh, I did do experiments in GMP CPP microtubules. Um, GMP CPP microtubules have 14 protofilaments, whereas GDP microtubules have 13 protofilaments. Uh, perhaps sadly, I found the diffusion length in both was the same. It was 6.6 .6 versus 6.7 nanometers, something like that. So uh, the hope was that the 14 protofilament microtubule would have a dramatically different diffusion length. Um, that didn't happen. Uh, does that answer your questions? Uh, 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 Arat, uh, can the uh, can the signal maybe go uh, from uh, one microtubule to another through a map? Could it be a network? Yeah, so these are the questions, right? I mean, these are, you know, at this point, the honest answer is we don't know. Uh, but, but these are the experiments that need to be performed. I mean, yeah, theoretically, it should be possible, right? Because you do, as long as the map has tryptophans, you could have energy hopping between uh, microtubules through the maps, through the tryptophan, the tyrosine in the maps. One more. Tam. Yeah, hi, Tam Hunt, UC Santa Barbara. Um, you looked at just um, intracellular photonics, right? And so I'm kind of curious mm -hmm. um, what you think of the potential for intercellular photonics uh, by whatever mechanism. Yeah, so this, is, this speaks to what Stuart was just asking, but, it, but, it's, but it's even more um, large scale, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is fascinating, right? You know, the, the thing is, these questions need to be answered in a very step-by-step manner. Uh, so right now, I looked at just within a microtubule. However, the next experiments will be between microtubules, and then perhaps we can look at microtubules to cell membrane, right? The cell membrane is also a lattice. And then between cell membranes, which will allow photonic energy migration between two different cells. So that's how I look at it. Um, does that answer your question? Maybe honor bonds, uh, optical vortices uh, could accomplish that. Uh, anyway, Ara, thank you so much. It was a great talk. Appreciate it. Good luck over there, and I uh, hope to see you again real soon, man. You're looking good. One more. One more <laughs> thank question. Thank you, uh, You know, uh, the, uh, Taxol, you mentioned Taxol, uh, which, which is an anti-cancer drug, and uh, it, uh, uh, people on Taxol require more anesthesia. 
So it might be competing with the anesthetic site. So it'd be interesting to see what uh, effect the Taxol might have on uh, the uh, fl uh, fluorescence transfer or the optical transfer. Just a thought. Yeah, it, it, it would be. I mean, Taxol also has a, Taxol also observes like, by the way, two to three nanometers. So it would, it definitely should affect uh, energy transfer, I think. Uh, okay. Thanks for that suggestion, Stuart. All right, let's give him a big round of applause.